All right, welcome to the Jack of All Trades training channel where I try to prepare you for your millwright certification exam one topic at a time. Today's video is going to be safety. I'm going to be asking a whole bunch of multiple choice questions or just uh, general questions that you might see on a certification exam in regards to workplace safety. Uh, please like and subscribe if you enjoy the content and you want to see more videos like this. And also be sure to check out the channel. There's a lot of really good information that I've got on there if you're interested in the trade. Fire requires an atmosphere with a minimum of how much oxygen to be sustained? 25%, 21%, 16%, 11%. The answer is 16%. If you drop the oxygen content from the regular 20.9% that is in the air today, or regularly, and you drop that down to 16%, that means that there's not enough oxygen within your fire triangle to sustain the combustion process. On a side note, um, although we need or we have 20.9% oxygen in our regular air day to day, the minimum amount for a human occupancy in a confined space or in an environment is 19.5% oxygen. So if you're in an environment where you're doing uh, some kind of a process like cutting or, or burning or something and it's using up oxygen, you need to be sure to put in proper ventilation, 19.5%. If you go below that, that's usually where you start to kind of start get sleepy and fall asleep and... Uh, you might not wake up. A fire extinguisher rated 6A30BC has the equivalent amount of chemical agents to extinguish a fire as how many gallons of water? 6, 30, 7.5, 60. Okay, the answer is 7.5 gallons. So let's break down this code 6A30BC. So the 6A is 6 times 1.25 gallons. Now, I don't know where the 1.25 comes from. If somebody knows where that's coming from, please just comment down below and let me know. I'm very interested. But the 6A means that it's 6 times 1.25. So we have 7.5 gallons equivalent cooling power of uh, water um, for an A-type fire. Now, A-type fire is your combustibles like paper and wood and uh, plastics and that kind of thing. And so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's 7.5 gallons of water, it's 7.5 gallons of water cooling power. So it could be some other chemical that has that cooling effect. The 30B here, that means that for a type B fire, which is your flammable oils and gas, the fire extinguisher will be able to cover an equivalent amount of 30 square feet of that liquid. So if the liquid pours out and covers 30 square feet, it can, it can extinguish it. If it's more than that, it's going to have problems. And then lastly, the C at the end, that means that it can extinguish a type C fire. Type C fire is an electrical fire. Other types of fires are a type D, which is combustible metals, and K, which is um, kitchen oil, grease, deep fryer stuff. Now, these colors, full disclaimer, these colors are all inverted. I have this presentation inverted. This writing was black and it made it white and everything. So all these colors are different. So I think it's like green, green, red. Um, blue, and then I think this one's purple, and this one I think is yellow or something like that. So um, these colors are off, but uh, make sure that you know what those different symbols are for the different fire types. Which of the following statements is true about Wemyss supplier labels? They are attached to the container which the material was shipped in. They're attached to the container in which the product is stored. They're mounted on the wall of the shop where the product is used. They are made available to all employees using this product. The answer is they are attached to the container in which the product is shipped. So over my face here, I'll slide over. Um, this is what uh, one of the supplier labels looks like. And that would be right on the side of the toad or the barrel that it gets shipped in. On here, you're going to have a product identifier. You're going to have um, initial supplier identifier. You're going to have pictograms a signal word, hazard statement, precautionary statements, and supplemental label information. So like where you would find the MSDS or the SDS and, and some other stuff. So that is all what it has to be applied to by the supplier. Now, while we're talking about SDS labels, let's talk about um, what goes on a workplace label. So the supplier sends it to you. And then if you were to take that from a large container, put it in a smaller container, you need to apply a workplace label to the container. In general, workplace where label will have the product name, safe handling precautions, and a reference to the SDS. Now, there's two situations in a workplace where you do not need those. 
One is if it's poured into a container and it's all going to be used up immediately. And the other one is if it's under control of the person who decanted it or put it in the other example, and you know that you're going to use it by the end of your shift. What is the first step when a worker refuses unsafe work? Employee, supervisor, and the HSC member will investigate. A government health and safety inspector is contacted. Employee notifies their supervisor. The employee is terminated without notice. The answer is the employee notifies their supervisor. Now there is steps and procedures that need to be followed when you approach an unsafe work situation where you don't feel comfortable doing the work. First thing that you have to do is you have to go and talk to your supervisor. You need to explain the situation and what is going on. The supervisor will then talk with it and talk with you and they'll figure out what the situation is. You either have a discussion and you deem that it is safe or there is an unsafe situation. At that point, the employee, the supervisor, and somebody from your health and safety committee will go and investigate the situation. If they look at it and they don't come up with a issue, or if they, if they can come to a solution to the issue, in which case the employee will return to work, it's all resolved and we're all good. If not, if the problem in the employee still doesn't have, it still takes issue with it and they don't like, that's when a government health and safety inspector can be called in. The health and safety inspector will look at it and they will give a decision in writing what they think are deemed to be safe or not safe for the situation. Now, it's a lot of times you can have an employee that maybe feels unsafe about something, but it actually is safe, in which case the inspector would just say, you need to go to work. If you don't feel like doing the job, then that's a matter of um, you are re retracting your services for something that is deemed to be safe, which is a whole other thing. But uh, in the most in, in usual cases, this is the, the escalation or the natural progression that you would have to go through in a refusal of, of uh, unsafe work. The symbol shown identifies which hazard, compressed gas, flammable or combustible material, oxidizing material, or radioactive substance. The answer is oxidizing. So this is an oxidizer, okay? Um, these are all of your hazard symbols, flammable, corrosive, biohazard, harmful, health hazard, oxidizer, compressed gas, explosive, toxic. Um, I think there's a R in there somewhere that's for radioactive stuff, which is kind of specialized. And um, But those are, for the most part, the, the, the symbols that you'll need to know. It could be on a test. Which of the following is an employee's responsibility in the workplace? They have a, uh, refuse unsafe work. Use PPE and clothing as directed. Participate in a workplace health and safety activities through their health and safety committee. Know or be informed about actual and potential dangers in the workplace. The answer to that is to use PPE and clothing as directed. So there's, there's kind of a difference here between your responsibilities and your rights. So your responsibility is to work your work in compliance with occupational health and safety, to use PPE, to report workplace hazards, to work in a safe manner, and to tell your supervisor if there's anything unsafe that you see. Your rights are a little bit different. You have the right to refuse unsafe work. You have the right to participate in your health and safety committee, and you have the right to know about any potential hazards. So in the question, I would put three rights and a responsibility. So the responsibility is different than the rights. While we're on the subject, let's look at what a supervisor's responsibilities are uh, or your manager. They have to make sure that you the workers are working in compliance. They have to make sure that they're using prescribed PPE and have to advise workers of any potential hazards. They have to protect, provide workers with written instructions and measures and pr workplace procedures and take every reasonable precaution to make sure that workers are safe. Employers need to establish and maintain their health and safety committee. They need to take every reasonable precaution to ensure the workplace is safe. Train employees, make sure, know how to handle and equipment safely and properly. Make sure workers use any necessary PPE. Immediately report all injuries and appoint a competent supervisor to make sure that everything is going smoothly according to regulations and policies. So that's the three different is worker, a supervisor, and employer responsibilities. How many sections are there on an SDS? Six, nine, 12, 16. There are 16 sections on an SDS form. Now, the UN standardized this. There used to be a system where all the different manufacturers or suppliers would have all varying different numbers of uh, categories on their SDS. And every time you pulled up one, if there was an emergency, you'd have to filter through and try and figure it out. 
Now they've standardized it to be their 16. Those 16 are identification, hazard identification, composition, first aid measure, firefighting, accidental release measure, handling and storage, exposure controls, physical and chemical properties, stability, reactivity, toxicological information, disposal consideration, transport information, regulatory information, and other information. Now, I don't think that you need to necessarily remember all of those. Just know that there are 16, that uh, those are the, all the things that are on it, and that um, it's all standardized for ease of reference in an emergency. What decibel level is hearing protection recommended? 60 to 70 decibels, 70 to 80 decibels, 80 to 90 decibels, 125 decibels. 80 to 90 decibels. Daily noise levels of 85 will damage hearing, so you need to wear hearing protection. If you're in an environment where you have that constant noise of 85 degrees, over time, you're going to start losing your hearing, so you need to wear your hearing protection. If you're in a situation where it's quiet, but there's a potential for large bangs or large noises, up and above 125 decibels, you would need to, you would be damaging your hearing once you get up to 125 decibels, so you need to wear hearing protection just in case at all times. What is the name of a device designed to protect workers from injury by moving parts? Interlock, disconnect, safeguard, or handrails? Safeguard. Safeguards are designed and engineered and standardized any modification of guards, interlocks, or disconnects without approval um, is illegal. Replace all bolts from replacing guarding after maintenance. From a millwright point of view, any kind of guard, whether it's on an angle grinder, whether it's on um, a belt drive, you know, you have like the large cages that go around your belt drives. If you don't go back and replace all the bolts all the way around that guard, it's technically been, um, technically been modified. And what I usually what I've seen happen is you take all the bolts, you get excited, you want to get to work, you finally got your permits, and then you go to take the bolts out, you put all your bolts off to the side. And then the last thing that you do at the end of a long shift is you got to put all those bolts back in. And if you don't put every single bolt back in, or if there is a bolt missing and you don't report it, um, you are technically liable at that point. So make sure that all the cards go back together. What must be installed on scaffolding where people are walking or working around? Handrails, yellow lines, safety ropes, tow boards. Tow boards. So these are all the basic parts uh, and the names of a, of a typical tube and clamp type scaffold system. Um, make sure that you know all these, but the one in this question is tow board. So the tow board is there. So if you have like a bucket of something or some tools, they don't get kicked off and fall down onto somebody. You have your mid rail, your top rail, you have the self dropping bar, you've got your ladder. Um, you have uh, standards, ledgers, base plates, sill, traverse, tra transverse bracing, uh, and then your scaffolding planks, which need to be a minimum of 2 by 12 Douglas fir or some type of, I think, Sitka spruce or something like that. There's all kinds of standards for the type. You can't just use any kind of wood for a scaffolding plank. So make sure that you know all that. Which of the following does not constitute a confined space? Restricted access or egress? A closed or partially enclosed space, not intended for human occupancy, poor ventilation, or hazardous atmosphere. Poor ventilation or hazardous atmosphere. Now, here's some examples of different types of confined space that you might see. Uh, poor ventilation or hazardous atmosphere can be present in a room or a place that is designed for human occupancy. So if you're going into work somewhere and it's very dusty or there's... Um, you know, not at a lot of, maybe it's, it's an explosive environment from dust, maybe there's a lack of oxygen, you need to make sure that you have proper ventilation, but that doesn't make it a confined space. Uh, going back to the last slide, confined space is when you have restricted access or egress, it is closed or partially enclosed. So like if it has to, if you have to crawl in underneath somewhere, uh, or if it's not intended for human occupancy, like if it's like a tank or a vat or something like that, that's large, but it wasn't actually designed for people to be inside. Those are all the things that would designate a confined space. When is an administrative control put in place for worker protection? To identify the correct personal protective equipment to be used in a hazardous situation, to document the parameters of engineering control design, when an engineering control cannot eliminate or control a hazard, to isolate the hazard through containment or enclosure. The answer is when an engineering control cannot eliminate or control a hazard. 
So this is your basic hierarchy of controls for safety if you have a hazard that is present. The first thing that you want to try to do is to eliminate that hazard. So if you can remove it from the workplace, then that is the preferred method. Obviously, if there's some kind of hazard and you can get rid of it, then get rid of it. If you can't get rid of it, maybe you can substitute it for something less hazardous. So if you have some like kind of chemical or something, maybe there's something else still there on the market that is less hazardous. If you can't do that, then you have to put some kind of engineering control, like ventilation or some kind of uh, interlock or something. Uh, if you can't do that, then there's an administrative control where you'd put in some kind of a workplace, workplace safe work situation. And then the last line of defense is your PPE or some kind of protective gear that would protect you from that hazard. So in that line of thinking, which is an example of an engineered control used to protect workers from airborne hazards? Established safety responsibilities, MSDS or SDS, ventilation system, or supplier labels? The answer is a ventilation system. So an enter a ventilation system would be an example of an engineered control. It's a way of if we have something that is hazardous up and above a certain amount of parts per million, you can put in some type of ventilation and that ventilation is going to remove or uh, reduce the hazard to a safe level. All right, time for the lightning round. I've got a whole bunch of true or false questions here on ladder safety or access equipment. Fall arrest is only required above three meters or eight feet. False. Fall arrest is required if there is a hazard present or above three meters. So you can, it's not necessarily if you're not up above three meters, if you could fall off something onto something dangerous, something spiky, something, something that's a hazard, then you need fall arrest. Never work or step on the top two rungs of a ladder. True. The proper angle of an extension ladder is five to one. False, it's four to one. Fiberglass ladders are electrically non-conductive. True. Be sure wooden ladders have complete paint coverage to prevent water damage. False, you can't see any cracks or any damage to a wooden ladder if it's painted. What is the safe limit of approach for an unknown power line? Answer is seven meters. If you don't know what the voltage is, we have to assume that it's the highest level voltage, which would be 500,000 volts. If it's 500,000 volts, it's, we're looking at seven meters uh, limit of approach before the electricity will jump to the nearest uh, thing. Uh, so if we don't know what it is, we have to assume that it's, if we don't know what the voltage is, we just assume that it's seven meters. So if you're working around cranes, if you're working with man lifts or anything like that, make sure you don't go within seven meters of a power line. So that's all the questions that I've got for safety. Um, I'm going to come back and do a little bit more safety videos later on once I get through with the majority of stuff. But I think that I've covered off most of the things that you would see on a certification exam. Please remember to like and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. And we'll see you in the next video.